I love streaming movies as much as the next guy. It's immediate, it's efficient, it's convenient, it's cheap. All of this new technology is great, but people forget that what came before was also great. When I was growing up, if you wanted to watch a movie, you had to either go to a movie theater, stay home and watch one on TV that had been edited for content, yippee ki Mr. Falcon, or seek out a rental at the local video store. Now, to some, this might have seemed like a huge pain in the ass, but to me, it was an adventure. Searching for the right movie to watch was as much fun as actually watching it. It was the thrill of the chase as you walked through the video store trying to find that perfect rental. Sadly, Netflix took over, first by shipping DVDs. Remember these? And then eventually moving on to streaming. Blockbuster struggled to keep up with this new technology, and one by one their stores eventually closed, and it seemed like all was lost. So I was browsing Netflix a while back and came across a documentary entitled The Last Blockbuster, and my interest was immediately piqued. So I pressed play, thoroughly enjoyed the documentary, and was delighted to learn that the last blockbuster refers to a physical store in Bend, Oregon. My sister Lisa lives up in the Seattle area, and I like to go up for an occasional visit. And I discovered that with a slight detour, I could reroute through Bend, Oregon, and stop off at the last blockbuster. So that's exactly what I did. After a very long time in the car by myself, I made it there. When I arrived, the parking lot was full and I immediately noticed a huge swarm of people outside of the building. It seemed like it was mostly adults and people my age. They were all taking pictures of themselves in front of the Blockbuster like it were some kind of historical monument. I was very happy to learn that they allowed filming inside the store, so I quickly retrieved my GoPro from my pocket, hit record, and started to point and shoot. They had DVDs and VHS tapes for sale and for rental. They had displays and memorabilia. Everything I watch, I stream here on the computer using Netflix or Amazon or iTunes or YouTube mostly, so I had no need for any kind of rental or movie purchase from Blockbuster, but I did want to support the store, and so I bought a number of gifts from the small little gift shop area they had set up. I bought three 500-piece puzzles, each with a different movie poster as a design. Each comes in a very cool replica clamshell case that you'd get for a VHS rental from Blockbuster back in the day. And last but not least, a very stylish pair of blue sweatpants with the Blockbuster logo running down the side. Back with another pair of those Blockbuster pants. It's good because it's getting cold in here. I love movies, I love puzzles, and I love sweatpants, so this should be a fun project. I was kind of late to the party on Animal House. As a kid, it seemed like an old movie to me. But as I get older and older and time goes on, I've grown to appreciate Animal House more and more. One of my favorite bits of trivia about the movie is that composer Elmer Bernstein initially wanted to come up with a silly score to match the silly tone of the screenplay, but director John Landis insisted that the music be very sincere and dramatic. And so Bernstein obliged and wrote the music that we're all familiar with today, but I think the score really elevates the story to a higher level. 
For most of the actors involved, this is the movie I reference when their name comes up. So anytime I see Bruce McGill or John Vernon or even Donald Sutherland in a movie, I say, hey, that's the guy from Animal House. Naturally, Karen Allen is still Marion Ravenwood and Thomas Hulse is still Amadeus. <laughs> Probably half of the screenplays that I've written, and I've written a lot, are based around the idea of a small group of losers or outcasts or bench warmers or misfits that have to go up against their competition, which is a larger, more established, better funded, more professional group. So we're rooting for the underdogs, which is really the nature of storytelling in general. So in my experience, uh, especially in comedy, most of the stories are Animal House meets blank. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. This is Elliot tries really hard not to embarrass himself. Take two. I didn't realize it until recently, but most of what I love from comedies in the 80s and the 90s was born out of Animal House. So this was the first attempt by National Lampoon to branch out from the world of magazines and actually do a feature film. So they assembled this incredible group of comedic voices, namely John Landis and Ivan Reitman, as well as the best from Canadian and American sketch TV. So a lot of people remember performances in Bluto, Flounder, or Niedermeyer, and they all are great performances. But for me, it's Tim Matheson's Otter that really steals the show. The issue here is not whether we broke a few rules or took a few liberties with our female party guests. We did. It's not gonna be an orgy, it's a toga party. No more fun of any kind. I'm not joking. This is my job. We can do anything we want. We're college students. Remain calm. All is well. Women. Can't live with them. Can't live without them. I discovered 16 Candles while researching the career of director John Hughes. 16 Candles is about a 16-year-old girl who has the blues because her family forgot her birthday. I always found it difficult to relate to this movie because I'm not, never was, and never will be a 16-year-old girl. Cheers. Also, I get excited when people forget my birthday. So if anyone is looking to get me a gift this year, that would be a great one. I always found it much easier to identify with John Hughes's male characters, namely those played by Macaulay Culkin, Matthew Broderick, and John Candy. Home Alone and Ferris Bueller's Day Off have both been favorite films of mine depending on what stage of my life we're talking about, and I'm basically Uncle Buck at this point. Much like Animal House, Sixteen Candles was also born out of the National Lampoon magazine. John Hughes used to work there as a writer. In fact, the vacation movie was based off of a story of John Hughes when he was a child on vacation with his family. And so through National Lampoon, he got connected with Harold Ramis and yada, yada, yada. Sixteen Candles was the first time that John Hughes was trusted with directing a movie. And he proved that he was obviously very talented at it and his directing career would go on to be one of the greatest and most impressive in cinematic history. There are a lot of memorable 80s classics on the soundtrack that I could have chosen from, but I'm using this as an opportunity to cover some Fallout Boy. You know me. I set my clocks early because I know 
I'm always late. It's showtime. Beetlejuice is arguably my favorite of the Tim Burton films, and Tim Burton is one of my favorite directors. He has a particular style and artistic flair, and it's very easy to identify his work, even seeing just one single frame. His movies during this era were very cinematic, with a great blend of the macabre, comedy, action, heroes, anti-heroes, villains, just everything that's great about movies is on full display here in Beetlejuice. One of my favorite things about movies in general is the music. And one of the best composers is obviously Danny Elfman. His working relationship with Tim Burton has led to an endless string of unforgettable classics. Danny Elfman doesn't really do it here in Beetlejuice, but in a lot of his later works with Tim Burton, he gives himself a big dramatic swell in the music when his name appears on screen. When I first noticed it, I thought, hey, that's kind of a cocky thing for the composer to do. That's kind of vain and self-indulgent. But then as I came to appreciate how much Danny Elfman has done for the world of music and soundtracks, I say, go for it. And now every time I see that happen in a movie, I get really excited. And every time I compose something myself, I try and give myself a, a big dramatic swell when my name appears. Of course, if you're a legendary composer like Danny Elfman, you can effortlessly get away with it and people will think it's cool. If you're a no-name hack like Elliot Devinney, it's a little harder to pull off. done with all three puzzles. That about does it for this project. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. If you have a Netflix subscription, be sure to check out the documentary. And if you're ever in the Bend, Oregon area, make sure you stop off at the last blockbuster. As for now, you'll have to excuse me because I have a sandworm to animate. Why did it have to be sandworms? Sandworms.